What leaves me uneasy about contemporary research on, on, on crime and punishment is that it takes for granted uh, the definitions of crime and punishment and focuses excessively on the nexus uh, between crime and punishment. It, 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 it starts from the premise that punishment is in fact um, uh, intended to respond to crime and that we all know what crime is. It happens to me very often in my own work, uh, some of my recent work on institutionalization and the, and the, and the levels of institutionalization uh, throughout the 20th century in mental hospitals and prisons, that I would want to address what is maybe kind of the a dominant discourse in the political debates, which is whether or not institutionalization or whether or not mass incarceration had an effect on crime, right? And, uh, and, and we do that in a somewhat easy way and often in a way that can kind of distort what's really going on. Um, in part because I think the category of crime itself often needs to be re-examined, that it's often taken for granted as to what is criminal behavior. And I don't mean this in the simple sense that, I don't mean this in the simple sense that there are a lot of, say, innocent people who are convicted of crimes. I mean it in a much more complex sense about what it is or how it is that something becomes considered a crime or adjudicated a crime. So this leads me to think that there are certain methods and certain kinds of work that we do that although they shouldn't be rejected, um, should be understood to be reactions to public discourse, reactions to public policy debates, and no more than that. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't engage in the kind of quantitative work that might be able to dispel the idea that a particular punitive practice reduces crime or, um, or causes crime. Uh, and most of the time that requires deep engagement, taking the assumptions for granted, accepting the assumptions of the, of the approach, um, uh, using the definitions uh, that exist in the work already, and replicating them. And I think that's very important work, and, and, and adding variables sometimes, uh, variables that have been ignored but that would wash out effects. Um, so I'm not suggesting that that work is to be rejected. I think it, it is important, but I think that it should be understood as a reactive part of our research project, of our research program. Um, reactive to particular claims that are being made. Um, by contrast, I think that the, the heart of the research should be to try and unearth the forces that are truly at play in these punitive practices uh, that we engage in as a society. And that's a different kind of work. It's not about the relationship between punishment and crime. It's about trying to understand what is hidden um, when we talk about a particular practice. Some of the research on stop and frisk, which began to focus on the way in which uh, policing kind of imposes a racial order, uh, has that effect, it changes the conversation. And in, in fact, it, it may be because of that that, um, uh, that uh, Mary de Blasio was successful in kind of changing the conversation over policing. That would be a situation where the, the more uh, hidden effects of the policy, what's not being discussed in terms of simply the crime problem in New York, uh, become more visible. Uh, and I think they were made more, more visible as a result of the research uh, in the litigation. And uh, you know, when, when Judge Shindlin actually found a, a, a violation of the Fourth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment on the basis of these disparate impacts, I think that did shift the conversation and that unearthed this other aspect of the policy and of the practices, um, of the way in which they 
kind of impose a particular racial uh, hierarchy or racial order uh, in a city like New York.